to Commitment to Truth, the outreach ministry of Commitment Community Church, a place for all nations. To learn more about Commitment, please visit our website, www.commitmentchurch.org. Like us on Facebook and download our mobile app. Now, let's enjoy today's message. I am finishing a series I've entitled for you, The King Is Here. And in John chapter 18, verses 36 through 37, you have the scene of Jesus Christ being before Pilate on his way to the cross. And unusually, uh, Jesus, if you would, takes Pilate back to the crib, uh, the manger with these words. He said in reply to uh, Pilate's comments, he says, yes, I'm king. For this, I've been born. And for this, I have come into the world. It says to testify to the truth. And we've been discovering and uncovering what this truth is. And this truth in summary is this. It is about the existence and the will of God. So Jesus Christ came as a humble baby in a manger, uh, grew to a man, uh, died on the cross, was buried, rose again on that third day to ultimately communicate and declare the truth about the existence and the will of God. So likened to that, um, God sent Christ uh, to be our example to, uh, so us and we can continue this, if you would, uh, responsibility to communicate the existence and the will of God uh, here still remaining on this earth. Now, what I did was I tried to provide for you three simple descriptions as it relates to how Christ came to uh, declare this, this truth and existence of God. The first was this, we, uh, we uncovered that Christ came as proof. He came as a clear tangible, true proof of of God in the flesh as Emmanuel. But then secondly, we uncovered that he came displaying his power. Now, we realize that the ultimate display of Jesus' power was his blood, right? That's blood that that eradicated our, our sins, past, present, future, that ultimately because of his death, we live again. Because of his death, we now can live forever with him in heaven and eternally and perpetually. But then also we, we started last week uncovering that Jesus Christ also came uh, giving us privileges. And we uncovered um, two of the of four privileges that I've kind of narrowed down uh, with all of us. Now, at the end of the day, we know there's tons of other privileges that God has given us uh, through Christ. But I narrowed it down to four. And the first of the first two of the four I gave you last week, and they were just as a quick review, Luke chapter 2, verse 18 through 14 summarize this, is that Christ came giving us the privilege of peace on earth. Now, I mentioned last week at the end of the day, you can look around you, right? Maybe you live in where you live. Maybe it's not that peaceful. But what God does give to you and I through the finished work of Jesus Christ, through Christ coming as king, is that in your part of the world, guess what? You can have peace. In your part of the United States of America, you can have peace. In your family, in your room, in your bedroom, in your bed, you can have peace on your side of this earth. Now, uh, we we determine this by a couple of passages. And Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 explains this. It says, the steadfast of mine, you will keep in perfect peace. And we answer the question, why? It says, because he trusts in you. So as we trust in him and lean out to our own understanding, what we'll begin to find out is God will keep our minds in perfect peace, right? But then also in Philippians chapter 4, we identified a couple of things. And the first was this. It says, as we approach God with prayer, in supplication, with thanksgiving, he says, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will what? It will rule your heart and your mind in whom? Christ Jesus, our Lord. So if we go to God in prayer rather than going to other people, when we go to God in prayer through thanksgiving, his wonderful promise to you and I is that what? His peace will rule our hearts and our minds, right? But then also it goes on to talk about in verse 9 is that if you practice this thing, if you set your mind on these things, and these things really were descriptions of, of who Jesus Christ and who God is, is that if you, if you keep your mind and your heart on these things, it says, not only will the peace of God with you be with you, but he says the God of peace will be with you. So his awesome promise is that, is that not only will he give us peace, but also the God who gives peace is promised to be with us in season and out of season. So he is here to give us perfect peace, at least on our part of the earth. But then also we found out in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through uh, 38, there's about 64 ofs. 
In other words, of someone, of someone, of someone, of someone. And we talked about last week that one of the biggest problems with with followers of Jesus Christ is that we are still in a place of being of my father, of my mother, of my grandparents, and maybe we don't have a really good of experience, right? And then that is carried into our present, ultimately tainting our relationship with God, our relationship with others, So we must begin to understand that God has come uh, and given his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for us to give us a royal lineage so that that we're not only of Lewis Charles Brown, but I'm now of whom? I am of God through Christ, right? So, So what you have in these particular verses was Jesus Christ's lineage, okay, and his genealogy. It started off by saying that he was of Joseph and it ended with he's of God. So just like us, it starts out with Cedric Brown is of Lewis Charles Brown, but it must end with what? I am of God. The same is true with each one of us here is that in this understanding of my new of, I now know that I have a new lineage, a royal lineage. And underscoring this is that we now know that God is not superly impressed with our loyalty, but he's more impressed with our royalty. In other words, when you... No, you are royal. That means that you know you are a king's kid, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you're set apart for what? Good works. In other words, when you, are no, when you know you have royal lineage, it will change how you appear. It will change how you conduct yourself. It would even change your mindset sometimes. So it's super important to understand Jesus Christ came as king. He not only came as king just to be king, but he came to ultimately let us know that we are a part of a royal lineage. And if we're part of a royal lineage, we must begin to be people who act like we are part of that lineage. Amen? In all facets of life. We are children of God that ultimately the world will not understand us because we have, been, we have a new identity that has been exchanged through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to our last two of the four privileges Christ came to give us. If you can turn with me to John chapter 14, we'll be in verses 16, 17, and we'll skip to verse 26. Now, as you turn there, we, we must understand that Christ also gave us the privilege of his Holy Spirit. Now, if we look at of the privilege of of the Holy Spirit of God indwelling those of who we believe is is that the scripture says that he has given up his spirit uh, to live within us that cries out, Abba, Father. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the impartation of his spirit, we now have the wonderful privilege to now call God the Father, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. So through the Holy Spirit, we have this intimate relationship with God that cannot be exchanged, that cannot be eradicated, that cannot be tampered with, even if we try personally and individually. So we have, you have wonderful privileges of, like that that's found through the Holy Spirit that indwells us. But then Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the scripture says that he, is, he, is, he will give us power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us to be witnesses in all the world. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17 so, uh, uh, suggests to us that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit is like a Roman seal that cannot be broken. So we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. But then also, guess what? We are led by a spirit. The spirit of God does what? Leads us. And then we also find in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, is that the Holy Spirit, believe it or not, will also reveal the mind of God. So if you ever wanted to know what was on God's mind, you can find what's on God's mind through his spirit. So that being said, there's so many other ways that we could continue to describe how the Holy Spirit can enable us through the privilege of his impartation if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But, but there's, there's a, some specific things I want to communicate to you that's found in John chapter 14, which think about this. If you had minimal time left with a, a group of people, What would you say to your family? What would you say? What would be your farewell address, if you would, to people you love, super important to you, right? So here's Jesus talking to his disciples, who he has spent three years of his life with. He is now saying to them, hey, I'm going to the cross, but before I go to the cross, I want to tell you something important. And this is what he begins to say to them. Verse 16, John chapter 14, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you for how long? 
forever, right? That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Why? Because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he does what? Abide with you and will abide where? In you. Skip to verse 26. It says, but this helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So he will, he will do what? He will teach you all things and remind you of all things. So when you look at this, you have the Holy Spirit being a few things I like to describe to you even further. Verse 16, the Holy Spirit is with us. Why? To help us. He's here to help us. And one of the biggest challenges followers of Jesus Christ have is this, letting God help us. I got this. You know, I got this marriage thing, but I'm failing at it over and over again. You know, I got this womanhood, but I'm failing. I got this manhood. I, I got this college thing down. I got this dating stuff down. And we fail over and over and over and over again. Why? It's because we don't let the Holy Spirit who lives within us to help us. This word help comes from the Greek word paraclete, which ultimately means that he comes alongside para, parallel, parallel park, right? All right, parallel lines, parallel. He comes alongside us he, as an advocate. He comes alongside us as an advocate to plead another's cause. In other words, there is no reason in the world that I ever have to defend myself because he's my advocate. Can you imagine all the marital problems that will end if one of the husband or the wife says, I'm cool. I don't have to defend myself. Can you imagine, young people, how many arguments you won't get into with your parents if you say, Mom, Dad, I'm good. And let God jump in there and be your paraclete, to be your defender, to be the one in the court of law with you. Can you imagine every pe- all the people that maybe who frustrate you will be silenced immediately if you just let God speak up for you? He wants to help you. Not in some things, but he wants to help you in all things. Then verse 16, you see this as well. His spirit is with us. It says forever. This word forever means an unbroken age and also eternity. So here we have, listen, God through Christ, through the Holy Spirit who indwells us, helps us, it says, in an unbroken age. In other words, there's no point in time in history that he won't be with you. Every second, every minute, every hour, right? Every day, every week, every month, every year, every decade, millennium, right? He is with you. Every scenario in life, every phase, every facet, every high, every low, there's not a second or a minute minute that the Spirit of God is not with you in all things to help you. But all we need to do is let him help. Verse 17, his spirit is with us to give us truth. Now, can we all agree today that you look around you? uh, We live in a world that's not very truthful or full of truth. Uh, I've shared this. Ladies, can you look at all the glamour magazines and, and be lied to? Absolutely. Because there's no perfect woman that's like that. A woman has no spot or blemish. Come on. You know what they do? They Photoshop every zit, every blemish. They increase figures, shrink waist, increase increase this size, that size, reduce this, that, other. And listen, there's no guy in any any sports magazine that has abs like that. (laughs) You cannot play professional sports, okay, and survive without eating. And the only way you're going to get abs like that is you just can't eat. Or you have to exercise, 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 exercise. And and, and something's got to give. But they will Photoshop and and crop and and put your head on someone else's body. Right? You know, make donkeys talk, literally. You know, you see see dogs talking on commercials. Come on. We live in a world that is all kinds of lies, lies, lies. Lies, lies. Untruth. 
<clears throat> untruth after untruth. So we need someone to, to vet out what's right and what's wrong. Listen, you'll keep yourself up at night as parents trying to think if your children are telling you the truth or not. <clears throat> you, you, you drive yourself crazy wondering if your husband is telling you the truth or not. But guess who knows? Listen, churches and church members, parishioners would drive themselves crazy wondering if, what are they going to do with the money? Can I tell you a secret? The truth always exposes it. History has shown what is in the darkness comes to light. But if I allow, listen, the helper to help me in every situation, what we can bank on is that truth will prevail. But one of the other dilemmas is this. I may live in a world that's not very truthful, uh, but I myself will struggle with truth. But I believe as well, if we allow him to help us forever in, in an unbroken age, throughout eternity, in every situation, he will also help us brought, bring truth. Truth has an awesome way of exposing things, but we need to let him be the one who brings that truth through us. Verse 26, we find out his spirit is with us to teach us. This is probably one of the greatest struggles because we don't like to be taught by the Holy Spirit. We like to be in control of the classroom. <laughs> right? It's like that, uh, that child who, who struggles sitting still and keeping his mouth closed in the classroom, you know, because the teacher's in charge and I don't want you to be in charge and I'm going to be in charge of this. And, or like that, that child who, who thinks they know everything but, and they're now trying to teach the parents and because you haven't lived life yet. And, you know, you have so many scenarios that we have, right? That person who comes to the job thinking they know everything but they've only been there a day or so and they're trying to now be management and teach everybody else what to do. So many scenarios in life we have that, but we find ourselves in those predicaments because we don't let the Holy Spirit teach us. This word teach means this, to hold a discourse with others in order to instruct them. How many times do we have this ongoing discourse with the Holy Spirit? No, well, no, yes, well, no, well, no, yeah, okay, yeah, yes, no, yeah, yeah, okay, God, no, I won't, yes. I mean, how many times he says to us, as single men and women, now you know where this relationship is going to lead before marriage. We keep doing it. How many arguments in a context of a marriage can be nipped in the bud if we listen to the Holy Spirit in the midst of the argument? Are we concede to the Holy Spirit? In the midst of the argument, I, I, I listen, be 30 years, January 15th. Here's the deal. Still today, if I don't listen to the Holy Spirit, I'm going down in ashes. <laughs> it is what it is. In every relationship, in every scenario in life, if we don't pause to enter the classroom of the Holy Spirit, we will flunk every time. If we don't humble ourselves to, to take heed to what the Spirit of God is choosing to dialogue with us about, to ultimately give us instruction on how to be a husband and be a wife and be an employer. Listen, if you start a business, who's the best person you can listen to to teach you how to do your business well? Can you imagine all the financial issues that we could circumvent if we just listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine how many marriages could be spared? Can you imagine how many heartaches that you could avoid if you let him teach you? 
This word teach also means to impart instructions. Uh, I visualize this, is that the Holy Spirit, when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, instantaneously, this Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. And instantaneously, you have a new owner's manual on how to conduct yourself. Instantaneously, you have an instruction manual that says, this is how you are to be a husband. Instantaneously. Instantaneously, it's like, this is how you should be a wife. Impart it within you. Instantaneously, through the Holy Spirit. Instantaneously, there is nothing or no situation that you will ever find yourself in, listen, in the church or in the marketplace, if we humble ourselves before God and say, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I'll let you help me forever. I'll let you help me in every situation of life, in every area of my life. I'll allow you to help me vet out truth. I'll let you come and instruct me, and I will sit at the table, and I will learn from you. God will teach you everything you need to know and how to do it and do it well for his glory. Do you realize some of the smartest people on the face of the planet, some of the inventors, do you realize? History shows that they have asked God how to use a peanut. And God revealed multiple ways of how to use a peanut. The scripture says it is God who gives witty ideas. So there's not nothing, anything in the world. I don't care how educated or uneducated you are. If you and I humble ourselves before God, listen, you could be A, D, A, D, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And at the end of the day, if you humble yourselves before God, you know what? He will recalibrate your brain. And I think I have a few of that in me. But as we listen to him, he will instruct us. And here's the final thing that he teaches us with. Have you ever wondered when you came to know Jesus Christ and it's almost like instinctively you realize that's wrong. I shouldn't be doing that again anymore. Well, you know, I just, something doesn't feel right about this. The last definition of the word teach is that he will instill doctrine. He instills doctrine. Have you ever looked at something or someone on TV and you're like, ah, that just something about that doesn't sound right? Or even if someone says something and you don't even know chapter and verse and you're like, yeah, you know, something doesn't feel right about that. He instills doctrine. You know why? The Spirit of God is Christ. Christ is the living word of God who lives within you. So you have the residence of the Bible in you that somehow, super, don't ask me how it happens, supernaturally is able to weigh doctrine on the inside that clues you in, not even having the privilege to even read it. Something on the inside says something doesn't line up there. Something I didn't really know how to say it or or or, you know, communicate what I'm feeling, but something is just not right. He instills doctrine. Christ came to give us the privilege of his Holy Spirit that there would not be a situation in our lives that we would not find help, that he would not be there to walk us through it, but we must embrace his truth We must embrace his teaching. And then finally, we find in verse 26, we must respond when he remember. He causes us to remember things. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is one of my favorite passages. One of the key verses, it says, let he who thinks he stand take heed lest he falls. Previous verses, he says, these things have been written for your remembrance. Previous verses The Apostle Paul takes the church of Corinth back to the children of Israel roaming in the wilderness. And he says, these things were written for your instruction. 
so that you will know that he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. And, and, and I believe the Spirit of God gives us that remembrance, but, but I affectionately say we all have selective amnesia. We remember what we want, right? But God, through his Spirit, will cause you and I to remember those things that will rescue us, that will set us free, that also will set us on track. But our responsibility is to respond when he causes us to remember. It says to cause us to remember, to recall to mind, and also to remind us. In every form of remembrance, he will be there to instruct you and I so that we could be men and women who follow the leading of his Holy Spirit in all things and find ourselves helped in every situation we will ever experience on this side of heaven. So lastly... Christ came to give us the privilege to reign with him. There's two passages of scripture I want to bring out to you. The first is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. And then we're going to skip to the last book of the Bible, Revelations chapter 20. Christ Christ came to give us the privilege to reign with him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, real quickly, verses 8 through 13, it says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendants of David, according to my gospel. For which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, uh, but the word of God is not in prison. For this reason, I endured all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement for if we die with him, we will also what? Live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, guess what? Unfortunately, it says he would also deny us. Lastly, verse 13, it says, if we are faithless, listen to this promise. He remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So here we find nestled within, reigning with him in these verses. As we reign with Christ, we also reign in life. And as super important as followers of Jesus Christ is that he gives us the strength through the power of his Holy Spirit to reign with him in life, to be more than conquerors through him who loved us. So that being said, you look at verse 9, it says, I suffer hardship, even imprisonment as a criminal. In other words, Paul was saying, you know, I didn't do anything wrong, but I was treated as though I was doing wrong. Sound familiar? Listen to what he says, but the word of God is not imprisoned. So if I stay focused on the word of God, I apply the word of God to my life. I follow the scriptures in every area of my life. No matter what man tried to do to lock me up, I would never be in prison. Verse 11, if we die with him, we will also live with him. This word dying is, is, is dying to yourself, but also living means this, to live physically, a physical life on earth. In other words, you and I have the privilege to live with him this physical life on earth to a point that is a new life living in union with Christ. So this life that I'm living with Christ, I've been crucified with Christ. Living in us is not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me, right? And, and I, I don't live I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his very life for me. I don't live for myself anymore. So here we find is that this part of, the, part of this reigning is, is, is only accomplished as I do what? Live with him. He lives in me. He lives through me. Therefore, I'm able to do what? Reign with him. Listen, this word reign is, is super important to grab a hold to. It means to possess supreme honor. Now, we know... There's no honor in ourselves. The honor is in who? Christ. So this is the example I like to give. If you didn't know, <clears throat> if the Philadelphia Eagles, hopefully, go to the Super Bowl and win it, did you realize that the athletic trainer gets a Super Bowl ring? Uh, the administrative staff get a Super Bowl ring. Even guess what? Guess who? The chaplain gets the Super Bowl ring. And guess what? None of them played not one second on the field. 
you, you know why they got the ring? It's, it's because of them. In other words, they have honor because they have been honored. Because of who Jesus is. And because we are associated with him, we too are what? Honored. And that's the privilege of, of being a king's, king's kid, a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart for good works that are unto him is that when, when he gets glorified, when he takes center stage, when he is made big, somehow we find ourselves getting a Super Bowl ring with him. Somehow, some way, things start working out well with us. Because he is made known. He is made big. He just kind of brings us along with the ride, even though at the end of the day, it has nothing to do with you and me. And lastly, which supports this, he says, if we're faithless, he remains what? This word remain uh, is, is super important. It means he remains in condition and he remains in character. So think about this. No matter what the condition is, he remains faithful. No matter what, his character remains the same. So, so why shouldn't I partner with him, right? Why shouldn't I, I, I reign with him? If, in fact, that if he remains faithful, there's nothing that can be concerned about. There's nothing that can overtake me. There's nothing that can defeat me. No matter what the condition is, he remains the same. He remains faithful. And if we're honest with ourselves, we can be faithless people. All we need is the right temperature. Faith goes right out the window. All we need is the right circumstance. Listen, all we need is the right person to enter our life. Faith goes right out the window. Right? Right? We, we, we exercise faith for marriage. We get married. What happens to our faith? We exercise faith for having children, right? Oh, God, give me a child. Give me a child. Oh, Lord, but we trust you. Can you pray and fast forward with me? I don't need a child. You know, I want God to bless the fruit of my, my womb. You have a child, then your faith goes out the window. Right? It, ha it happens in the marketplace, right? Can you believe with me? You know, I'm believing God for, for, this, for this, you know, uh, advanced degree, and, and I'm praying for God to, to give me. Oh, yeah, praise the Lord. God is working in my life. Hallelujah. 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 And then, and then uh, you get the job, and... You have a run-in with the boss or you don't like somebody on a job. And then what happens to the faith? I'm, I'm reading this book about uh, church planting and church multiplication. And I was just reading it this morning. And, and it, was, it was talking about this church planter going out, planting a church, planting a church. And he has faith, faith, faith. Oh, yeah. We're going to grow the church year one, year two, year three. Year one bombed. Year two bombed. Year three bombed. And he wanted to quit. That's realism. That's real Christianity. So I don't know what picture you have, you know, who, who's tricking you, but that's real Christianity, right? And so many times we, 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 we're, we're, we're so naive, if you would, that, oh, nothing's going to go wrong. Oh, nothing, everything is all. And I used to be there. I asked my wife. <laughs> But there's realism, but the beautiful thing is this. He'll take a grain of a mustard seed, and he'll multiply my faith. He'll take, O oh, ye of little faith, and still work with me. I still can come to him and say, Lord, I believe, I believe, I believe. But God, really, you know, there's a part of me that still struggles with believing. And I can say to him honestly, Lord, help me in my unbelief. I can honestly say, you know what? I have this issue. I have this thorn. And I'm like, man, God, I just, I can't get through this issue. I just can't overcome it. I can't, over I got this anger. I got this, I can't control my mouth. My, uh, uh, and God, help me, help me, help me, help me. And I just keep falling on my face. When you're weak, then I make you strong. And that's just the way God does it. It's like, he, it's almost like he says, yeah, you know what, let me kind of encourage you a little bit. I give you a little faith to get you over the hump. 
But once you get over the hump, you're going to realize that, you know what, you don't have much faith at all. And to me, that's where this verse comes to mind, is that at the end of the day, the, beauty thing, the beautiful thing God gives you and I is that when I'm struggling with faith, he remains faithful. You know why? Because it's about his reputation. He will preserve his reputation through you and through me. Well, all we need to do is trust in him, let him be the shepherd of our souls, let him rule and reign our lives, and then we what? Reign with him. Here's the last part of reigning. We reign with him in life, but then also we reign with him over death. I was going to first say reign with him in death. No, it's because at the end of the day, death is defeated. So we reign with him over death. So Revelations chapter 20 Verses four through six gives us our last portion of scripture. It says, then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshiped the beast of his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, it says, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So here's the blessing that God gives us. He gives us us the ability through, uh, through Christ and his kingship and his, his kingdom to rule over death and also rule over the second death and reign in the second death and over the second death. Second death is simply this. Uh, instead of absent from the Lord, absent, absent from the body, present with the Lord, absent from the body, away from the Lord. Okay, in other words, there's a second death that you're going to hell. There's damnation to you, eternal separation from God. But through Christ, we have what? We are able to reign over this second death. Therefore, this word power, listen to what it says. It's, the word power means liberty to do as one please. The awesome thing, because Jesus Christ is king, and we have put our faith and trust in his kingship, the privilege that we have is this, is that this death no longer has the liberty to do what it pleases with us. Has no privilege. It has no more permission. But here's a final definition of the word power. Physical and mental power. The knowing of the second death no longer has physical or mental power over me. That's so important to understand because I personally believe knowing where your end is should help you also reign as you live. Where you know your end and final destination is should empower you, encourage you, strengthen you, give you the endurance to also reign when things are tough when things are dark, when things are gloomy, when things are frustrating, that you know at the end of the day, if death can't defeat me, what can you do to me? Jesus says, fear not the man who can kill the body, but fear the one who's able to kill and destroy the body and the soul. And the only one who can do that is God himself. So if you're able to get that in your head and your heart, that you know what? You can't harm me in the end, end. There's nothing you can do with me today. Christ came to give us power to live victoriously, not only in life, but also in death. Let me end with this. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us the best educator known to man. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us someone like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs to help us. If our greatest need had been science, God would have sent us a renowned scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist or somebody like Warren Buffett. 
If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us Hollywood, the NFL, the NBA, or anything else that tickles your fancy, you know, uh, that, that, that excites you and pleases you just to sit and watch and enjoy and even participate in. And listen to this. If, God, if our greatest need was companionship, God would have sent you the perfect husband and the perfect wife. Or the perfect friend. But you know it as well as I do. At the end of the day, none of these things work. And here's the final thing. If our greatest need was the comforts of the United States of America, he would have sent us all a president we can all agree on. And if we can agree on them, still wouldn't be good enough. So our challenge is not filling our needs with empty stuff and people and places and things. But thank God that he knew our greatest need was forgiveness. It's to be reconciled back to God. So he said, I will send my son Jesus, the Savior of all mankind, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Emmanuel, God with us, who ultimately is with us. Listen, when I need information, when I need companionship, and I need stability, guess what? He is always, he is always with me. So let's turn again to the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he's the ultimate answer, not only in this season, but every season of your life. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you for listening to Commitment to Truth, the outreach ministry of Commitment Community Church. If you would like to learn more about Jesus Christ, please visit our website, www commitmentchurch.org forward slash start. This website will walk you through having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Please let us know if you made a decision to follow Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or if you would like to support God's word through this ministry, please visit our website at www.commitmentchurch.org. Lastly, if you or your family are in the South Jersey or Philly metro area, please visit us at Commitment Community Church.